Nice. Hey, uh, one of the things we do at Christmas time is remember all the prophecies about Jesus coming as the Messiah. And so we have Advent reading. So today we have the Grow family come on up here. It's JB and Katie Grow, and uh, but JB could not be here today, but his sons are more than capable. Beckley's a senior at Jesuit, Tyler's a freshman at Jesuit, and Colby has taken over Whitford as a sixth grader. <clears throat> The word Advent literally means coming. As such, the Advent season is a time to remember that Jesus both came into the world and has promised to come again. Advent points to the past, present, and future. We remember the past birth of Christ, of the Christ child. We anticipate our present celebration of his birth, and we hope with expectancy for his future return. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2 says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. We light these candles in anticipation of the coming light of Christ Jesus. These three can candles represent the hope, peace, and joy we have in Jesus Christ. Speaking of the joy found and offered in Jesus Christ, the following verses were written hundreds of years ago before the birth of Christ, yet prophetically and poetically speak of his coming and what it will mean to the world. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 3 through 7. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for sending your son into the world. We remember his birth, death, resurrection, and look forward to his return. Today we celebrate the joy we have in Jesus. Help us prepare our hearts for the coming light of Christ. Amen. Thanks, guys. Do you ever wonder what God wants you to do? Maybe you're a high school student and you know you'll be going to college next year or in a couple of years and you wonder, what school does he want me to go to? Or maybe you're just getting out of college and uh, you're wondering, what job does he want me to take? Maybe you've got a couple options. Or maybe, you know, you're just thinking through a, a career path or a, a, a job change and wondering what career would God want me to pursue? Uh, maybe you have a medical issue and uh, wondering what treatment would be best. There are several options. What, what do you want to do? Or maybe you're wondering about the choice of a mate. Who should I marry? Might help if I date someone first, so who should I date? The good news is that God wants to guide you in all those questions if we ask for his help. So how do we know when God communicates with us? Uh, and when he does, will we listen? Will we be aware that he's talking to us, and will we obey? Now, this is the third in a series of messages called Just Obey. We're looking at five people who heard from God, 
Some ignored him, didn't do what he asked. Some did what he asked and looking at how that worked out for them. I'm suggesting to you that God speaks to people, all people, all over the world, multiple times every week. The question is, will we listen? Will we understand it? Uh, he usually speaks, uh, he speaks in a number of ways. He speaks through the Bible. He speaks through dreams. Uh, but usually it's through a still, small voice or a prompting or an impression. God wants a relationship with us where we're communicating back and forth throughout each day. So we have to learn to listen for his voice, recognize it, and then train ourselves to just obey. You can always talk yourself out of obeying, hear from God and say, ah, that can't be God. That's just my, you know, my mind coming up with stuff. Uh, I'm suggesting that instead of arguing with God, just obey. So what does it mean to just obey? To find an answer, let's turn to Matthew 1, 18 to 25. If you'd like to use the Bible in the seats in front of you, uh, it's on page 966. I think just obey means at least three things. First, just obey doesn't mean we don't think or ask questions. When God asked Joseph to take Mary as his wife, and be the earthly father to God's son, Joseph thought about it, and he had lots of questions. Matthew 1.18, we read, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. Now, marriages were done a little differently in those days. A person was engaged to be married, and when they were, they would have a full-blown marriage. So Mary and Joseph had done that. But they did not consummate their marriage uh, sexually yet. So that was a kind of a part two of this process. That's why they called them engaged. Um, 18. But before they came together, that is physically, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now what if you were Joseph? You're engaged to be married. Your wife, she's your wife. She tells you she's pregnant. But you know you're not the father. You'd feel betrayed, maybe. Angry? You might be thinking, how could I be so stupid? Why didn't I see this? I feel like such an idiot. In those days, most marriages were arranged by parents. I long for a return for those days. <laughs> I've got seven single children. I can think of all kinds of mates that would be perfect for them. One little boy said, I hope a pretty girl moves in and she lives on my side of the street. The guy says, why your side of the street? He said, well, I hope to get married someday and my mom won't let me walk across the street. <laughs> in most Christmas pageants, Joseph plays a very small role. Usually doesn't have a speaking part, just stands there. Most of the focus is on Mary, the baby, the shepherds, the wise men. And uh, he seldom has a singing a role. Uh, but Matthew begins his gospel from Joseph's perspective. Joseph had a problem. His wife was pregnant, but not by him. So he thought about what his options were. He could have just taken her as his wife, claimed the baby was his own. But that would be a lie. The Jewish uh, teaching said that she could be stoned, a woman caught in adultery could be put to death, but he loved her. He didn't want to do that. He could divorce her publicly. That would shame her, humiliate her. It would, it would uh, mean likely that she could never be married again. Who would want her? With a child, who would want her? A woman today with a baby or more than one kid can pretty easily get married, but not those days. But he didn't want to hurt her, didn't want to disgrace her. So he wondered what to do. Verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. He was a righteous man. He was a good man. He was tenderhearted. So he came up with a fourth option. He would put her away quietly. No one has to know that she's pregnant, at least for six to nine months. Uh, nobody has to know 
why we broke up. Just quietly end the relationship. He did not want to humiliate her, didn't want to ruin her life. This may give us some idea as to why God chose Joseph. He was a good man, a pure man, a tender-hearted man. Why he chose him to be father to his son on earth. But the point I'm trying to make is just obey doesn't mean we don't think or ask questions. Joseph had all kinds of ideas going through his mind as what he would do. He was asking all kinds of questions. Just obey doesn't mean we don't think or ask questions. Two and a half years ago when we moved into this building, I felt prompted by the Holy Spirit that we should focus on helping McKay School. I mean, after all, it's practically across the street. 400 students, a little less. 62% of them are on free lunch programs. So, you know, there's plenty of need there. Uh, we had helped before at Whitford, and, uh, but I didn't feel like we really got very far, and uh, so, uh, so I felt prompted by that. So I asked Sam Miller if he would head it up. He says, whatever you want, Ron, I'd be happy to do that, and he's done a great job. So we have maybe 10 to 12 people are tutoring people. Uh, Chris Quinn tutors people at Whitford. Uh, we have people that are reading buddies uh, with students. Uh, we have people that pack backpacks. Each week, we send home about 25 backpacks. These are two kids where uh, the, the principal thinks they might not have any food uh, in their home on the weekend. Uh, once a year, we do a cleanup day there. Maybe 30 of us or so gather. And um, we helped with a couple carnivals last year. Uh, Jory and Jamie and Eric and I signed up to help with the carnival. As it turned out, uh, Jamie had a conflict and Jory had a conflict. So just Eric and I went. And uh, so I saw Jacqueline there who did a great job organizing it. And she said, uh, here's where you're going to work. And so we were working at the fishing booth. And so they had this big high wall covering us totally. And people would throw the line over. And then uh, we would put a little gift on there. And then they'd yank it back and get their gift. So we did that for about two and a half hours. I never saw anybody the whole night. I mean, I'm behind this wall. I never talked to anybody. And as we were driving home, I was saying to Erica, I said, ah, I don't know if this stuff at McKay is really working. I don't know if we're accomplishing anything. I mean, are we making any difference? And then Amy Sides, who heads up our uh, backpack group, sent me a note uh, from one of the families that gets these backpacks and she says you have no idea how much this means to us and signed their name my point is that just because we felt led by God to serve McKay doesn't mean we don't ask questions is it working are we making a difference does our help matter I mean, we probably have 50 to 60 people uh, working there. We, uh, if you add in all the people that give money or uh, bring food uh, for the backpacks, we probably have 100 of us. Is it a good use of our valuable people resources? Just because we think we've heard from God doesn't mean we actually have or we got the message correctly. Sometimes we get it all wrong. Uh, first grade class was having a uh, Christmas party. Cindy had chicken pox, so she couldn't attend. But her mother decided to go anyway. When she got there, she noticed all the kids, and some kids were dressed really well, and obviously came from well-to-do homes. Other kids were dressed poorly. Uh, their clothes were, you know, tattered and faded and holes in them, and, and the shoes, you know, were not good. And she focused on one guy particularly. He had, you know, holes in both knees and shirt was frayed at the collar and um, faded and his shoes had holes in them and and he, he kept going up to the food table and he was getting all this food all these cookies and he would go back and then a little bit later he'd come back again fill it up with cookies again and go back and came back a third time got lots of cookies and she thought boy i bet he doesn't have much at home i wish we could just send all the cookies home with him well, she was getting ready to leave, she was surprised this little boy came over her beaming. And she was even more surprised when he offered her a big plate of cookies. You see, he hadn't been gathering cookies for himself. It was for Cindy, who was sick and couldn't come. 
She'd gotten it all wrong. She assumed he was getting him for himself. When Mary got pregnant, Joseph didn't, didn't just say, oh, well, I'll marry her anyway. He thought about his options and what he should do. God never minds our questions. Two, just obey means we recognize and listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. God spoke to Joseph. Let's see if he heard God's voice and recognized it. Verse 20, after he had considered this, all these options of how he was going to end it with Mary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Suddenly, Joseph learns who the real father is. Mary has conceived by the Holy Spirit, just like she told him, but he hadn't believed. Joseph realized he has been chosen to be part of God's plan. The Lord told Joseph that the child growing in Mary's womb is the son of God. He was calling Joseph to be a surrogate father to his son. It was a call that placed a great weight of responsibility on Joseph. There was a call on Joseph's life, just like there was a call on Mary's. He is to take care of Mary as his wife and to raise the son as his own. Then Joseph is told more, 21. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Typically in Jewish society, the husband, the father, gives the name to the child. Joseph was to name him Jesus because his purpose was to save people from their sins. Uh, Jesus means Yahweh saves. Joseph was to name Jesus, which is significant. In naming the son, he is adopting Jesus as his own son. He's not going to be a distant stepfather who keeps at arm's length. He is name, adopting him as his own son. This explains why Matthew starts his book with the genealogy of Joseph. And that he was, a, he was a descendant of David. Remember all the prophecies said that the Messiah would come and be a descendant of David. The reason he was is because it was through Joseph who adopted him as his earthly father. Now Matthew makes a comment, verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. That means God with us. This fulfills what was prophesied years before. This is the moment we've been waiting for. This is Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus will come in a womb of a woman. He will be God and man, God with us. God spoke to Joseph in a dream, but Joseph had to recognize God's voice. He had to listen to what God said. He could have thought when he woke up from his dream, this is crazy. I mean, conception by the Holy Spirit, it's never happened. Impossible. Remember Joshua? Joshua got the baton from Moses. Moses led the people out of Egypt with lots of miracles. Joshua led the people into the promised land with lots of miracles. The first miracle was uh, God stopping the Jordan River so they could walk across on dry land. And then God said, I want you to defeat the town of Jericho. Here's how I want you to do it. I want you to march around the town seven times. About the third time, I'm sure Joseph is thinking, this is stupid. I mean, what kind of battle plan is this? We feel silly out here marching around. But God says, when you get to the end of the seventh time, I want you to shout, and the walls will come crumbling down, and then you can take the people. And that's exactly what happened. Joshua thought it was maybe a little crazy, but he believed and obeyed. Same thing with Joseph. He could have thought, no way. I'm just an ordinary man. Mary's just an ordinary woman. Why us? This can't be for real. That's the amazing thing. Mary and Joseph are, well, normal. Normal stays up late with laundry and wakes up early for work. Normal drives the carpool wearing a bathrobe and slippers. Normal is Norm and Norma. 
not prince and princess. Norm sings off key. Norma works in a cubicle and finds it hard to find time to pray. Norm struggles to pay the bills. Norma battles with health issues. But that's just it. God came to ordinary people like you and me. You live an everyday life. You have bills to pay, beds to make, grass to cut. Your face won't grace any magazine cover. You aren't expecting a call from the White House to fill a position. You qualify as a normal person, just like Mary and Joseph. Just like them, you have to discern when God is speaking to you. Then you have to decide if you will just obey. Three, just obey means we do what God asks us to do. Just because God spoke to Joseph in a dream didn't mean he would obey. He knew that people would believe that Mary had an affair with another man. Or he got raped, she got raped by a Roman soldier. Or that he and, jo he and Mary just couldn't wait until they were fully married. In fact, those rumors about them swirled all through Jesus' lifetime. Joseph could have cried, God, I'm a good man. I'm a righteous man. I don't want to take this shame on my shoulders. But Joseph did not argue with God. He didn't talk himself out of it. Instead, we read, verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. He just obeyed. He did what God asked of him. He was willing to endure public shame. He was willing to take as his wife a woman everyone assumed was an adulteress. He was willing to raise a child that everyone thought was illegitimate. He was willing to just obey in the face of criticism. He took care of Mary, even though many people shunned her, made fun of her, and thought he was a fool. Maybe you're raising a child that isn't your flesh and blood. Maybe you're a stepdad or an adoptive father, or a grandpa raising grandkids. If that is you, know this. God must think highly of you. He has asked you to step in to an empty spot and fill a role. He's called you to be a Joseph in the life of a child. May you do what Joseph did. May you love that child so much that they think you're their father. That child may not have your eyes or nose or even your name, but they can have your love. Whenever we do whatever we feel God is asking us to do, good things usually happen. Austin uh, grew up in Brookfield, Wisconsin. As a young middle school age uh, kid, he learned about the plight of orphans, mostly in Africa, whose parents had died of AIDS. He wanted to do something for them, but what could he do? He was just a kid. Well, he was a basketball player, a good one. He could shoot baskets. And so he got some sponsors to sponsor him shooting free throws, and he shot 2057. He raised $5,000. The next year, he got some of his friends to join in with him, and he raised $80 million. Third year, he got even more organized and got coaches working with him, and they got all their players, and he raised $150 million. Last year, he raised $4 million. Just a kid, convicted by God that he should do something, and he did it. That's what Joseph did. God asked him to take Mary as his wife, take care of her, and to be the father to Jesus, and he just obeyed. Verse 25, he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. He did this to fulfill the prophecy that a virgin would give birth to God's son. Joseph and Mary never came together physically until after Jesus was born. A lesser man would have demanded his right as a husband. 25, and he gave him the name Jesus. Jesus knew that the child's true father wanted the child to be called Jesus. So Joseph named him Jesus. 
Since that day, millions have bowed around the world at the name of Jesus. Oh, the power of a name. Babe Ruth is considered to be one of the greatest home run hitters in the history of baseball, maybe the greatest. He signed a lot of, autographed a lot of home run balls, but only seven bats during his career. And uh, the first one was given away by his agent uh, for a home run uh, derby. The winner, they never did get his name, and he walked off with the bat, and that bat disappeared. And uh, this man grew to a, a good old age, and all his family had died off, and his closest friend was the nurse who took care of him in his final years. And so one day, he presented her with his bat. It was uh, you know, a big gift for him, but for the nurse, it didn't mean much. She didn't fall baseball, and okay, so she just stuck it under her bed. Well, she retired a number of years later, and... Uh, um, she wanted to start a restaurant, but she didn't have any money. So she thought about that bat. She said, maybe this is worth something. So she took it to a memorabilia shop, and uh, uh, the owner suspected that this was a real Babe Ruth bat. So he brought in a couple experts to check it out. They talked to her, got her story, checked out the bat, and they decided it was the real thing. So um, uh, on uh, Sotheby's, they, uh, she auctioned it off for $1.3 million. She had enough to start her restaurant, and then with the money she didn't use, she used it to meet the needs of children, what she knew Babe Ruth would, would, would love. And a reporter asked her why she gave so much money away, and she said, well, the only real value of the bat was Babe Ruth's name on it. And so when I didn't need any more of it, I wanted to do something to honor him, what I know he would want to do because he cared so much about children. Nothing honors God more than when he asks us to do something, we just obey. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, he's put his name on you and you honor him by obeying when he asks you to do something. So what does it mean to just obey? Think and ask questions. Two, learn to listen for and discern the voice of God. It takes practice. We probably miss many of the things God says to us because we're not practiced at listening. And three, when you sense the Holy Spirit prompting you, just obey. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Joseph, what we learned from him, that when he heard from you in a dream, from an angel, prompting he didn't argue his way out of it but he did what you asked him to do and we want to be the same kind of people lord you speak to us and we want to know when you speak to us and be more sensitive to that and be people who respond not not talk our way out of it so help us to do that i want to give you a moment to pray right now if you've never committed your life to jesus christ that would be a great place to start you say jesus i believe you're god's son you died on the cross for my sins. Would you forgive me and come into my life? Or maybe you want to commit to being more sensitive to when God speaks to you through his Holy Spirit and to just obey and not argue your way out of it. You pray. Lord, we really do want to be people who are connected to you. We know when you speak to us and we're listening to you and we're, we're working in relationship with you and obeying you. So help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray.